Chapter 24 The Profitable Profit Plan To all his lions who fight for his religion go the spoils that come from their prey. Since the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior, we have been conditioned to expect a continuance of Islamic greed and violence. Tabari, the Prophet had been given possessions of Mecca following his conquest, but he only stayed a fortnight. He received news that the sheep-herding clans of Hawazin and Thaqif were encamped at Hunayn, intending to fight him. These Arabs knew what you know. Muhammad in Islam spelled trouble. Muslim militants had raided most every village in North, West, and Central Arabia. They would have attacked Eastern Arabia, too, but there was nothing there. Ishak and Tabari These tribes assembled after hearing about how the messenger had conquered Mecca, thinking that the Muslims were intending to invade them next, when the Prophet heard that they had decided... To defend themselves, he went out to meet them at Hunyain, and Allah, the great and mighty, inflicted defeat upon them. Allah has mentioned this battle in the Quran. The reference is from the ninth surah, a revelation that must have dribbled down over a prolonged period. It includes segments that were intended to rally the troops and justify the attack on Mecca, all the way through the subsequent raids on Byzantine Christians the following year. As you may recall, Allah's Hunian recitals were sandwiched between his assault on the family unit and his attack on Christians and Jews. The Islamic God called the people who had invented him unclean and barred them from the house they had built for him. Regarding the battle, he cried, In Quran 9, verse 25, Assuredly, Allah gave you victory on many battlefields, and on the day of Hunyain, behold, your great numbers elated you, but they availed you not, and you turned back in retreat. But Allah did pour his Sakina on the messenger and believers, and sent down forces which you saw not. These would be Allah's angels. He punished the infidels, such is their reward. Allah was as eager to take credit for the savagery of his followers as Muhammad was to make his butchery appear godly. It was a symbiotic relationship. The Arabs, who had not yet been infected by Islam, weren't adept fighters. Ishak, when Malik, the Hazawan chief, decided to fight the apostle, he had his women, children, and cattle accompany the men. He explained that by bringing them, the men would have to fight to defend them. There are some interesting sidebars here. First, Malik, whom the Muslims describe as the chief sheep tender, sent out spies to obtain intelligence, but they came back with their joints dislocated. When he asked what had happened, they said, We saw white men on black horses. Before we could resist, we were struck as you see us now. Tying men's arms behind their backs and hanging them from meat hooks so as to dislocate their shoulders is still a preferred form of Islamic torture. Second, Muhammad also sent out spies, his mingled amongst the crowds, gathering information, much like they do in Europe and America today. Ishak, when the spies learned Malik's plans, they returned and informed the Prophet. Muhammad in turn informed Umar, the second caliph, who called the Prophet a liar. Horrified, the Islamic spy said, Umar, you may accuse me of lying, but you have denied the truth for a long time. The fact that Umar became caliph proves you don't have to believe Islam to benefit from it. Muslim leaders play their subjects like a maestro conducts an orchestra, or more correctly, like a khan plays his mark. Third, the Muslims were overly fixated on booty. The spoils had been divided before the battle was even waged. Tabari, since the Hawazin and Thaqif had marched with their women and children and flocks, Allah granted them as booty to his messenger, who divided the spoils among those Quraysh who had recently embraced Islam. I want to thank Muhammad and his companions for making this so easy. They have once again validated my theory. The motivation for Islam was sex, power, and money. 
having conquered the Meccans, acquired the Kaaba ink, and compelled the Pledge of Allegiance. It was time to demonstrate Islam. With 2,000 Quraysh in tow, Muhammad raided two tribes. He divided their wealth, enslaved their children, and offered their women as a spoil, as a godly bribe. And by giving preference to the Meccans, he made them mercenaries. While the Prophet didn't yet control their minds or hearts, he held sway over their wallets. Tyrants throughout time, political, corporate, and religious, have ruled in like manner. While marching to attack the Arab tribes, Muhammad conned some pagans out of their armor and their swords. Ishak, lend us your weapons so that we might fight our enemy. Tabati tells us that Baker said, Today we will not be overpowered on account of small numbers. Then in Tabati, volume 9, page 8, we learn that arrogance soon led to disaster. The messenger marched with 2,000 Meccans and 10,000 of his companions who had come with him to facilitate the conquest of Mecca. Thus there were 12,000 in all. Muhammad left Abshams in charge of Mecca. Muhammad liberated Mecca the same way Stalin liberated Eastern Europe. As they marched towards their prey, the great Sulami said, In Ishak, This year the ghoul has smitten people in the midst of their tents as the ghoul has many forms. All wild ass is inedible. The Hawazin tribe is diseased, so I think that Allah's apostle will attack them in the morning. The next hadith reports. Tabari and Ishak. We descended through a sloping valley at the twilight of daybreak. But the enemy had gotten there before us, and we were waylaid by them in a narrow pass. They had collected themselves and were fully prepared. By Allah, we were terrified. As we descended, their squadrons made their first assaults on us as if they were one man. Our people were routed and fled, no one turning to look back. Allah's apostle withdrew and cried, Where are you going? Come to me. I am Allah's apostle. I am Muhammad, son of Abdallah. It was to no avail. The camels just bumped into one another as the Muslims ran away. Pathetic, isn't it? Allah's apostle withdrew and cried, Where are you going? Come to me. I am Allah's apostle. Muhammad's militants were under no illusions. They were out for easy booty not some religious crusade. They were pirates because stealing was easier than working. They didn't believe Muhammad was an apostle any more than I do. They just ignored him. Sage advice, if I do say so myself. It got so bad, Tabati reports. When the polytheists overwhelmed the Muslims, the prophet got off his mount and started reciting verses in the Rajah's meter. I am the prophet, it is no lie, I am the son of Abd Mutalib. The first line was pathetic. The second was a confession. Abd Mutalib had been the last in Kusay's line to control all aspects of the Kaaba ink. Muhammad was using this scam to establish his authority. Next we learn that the previous prophet's command to love your neighbor as yourself didn't apply to this peculiar order of religious stalwarts. Tabari and Ishak, when the Muslims fled, the uncouth and rude fellows from Mecca who were with us saw that we were in total disarray. Some of them spoke in a manner that disclosed the hatred they harbored against us. Abu Sufyan, the Meccan chief turned Muslim warrior, had divining arrows with him, but another Muslim said, Sorcery is useless today. Sufian replied, Shut up! May Allah smash your mouth! This episode is alarming. First, we discover the gambling game of divining arrows that had saved Abd Allah, Muhammad's father, was satanic. Second, witchcraft was routinely practiced around the Kaaba. And third, these Meccan Muslims who had lived next to the Black Stone for decades knew that Allah was useless. So now they feared that things were so bad that the almighty Satan couldn't even rescue them. Well, things continued to spiral out of control. Tabari and Ishak 
When Muhammad saw his men confused and in disarray, he repeated, Where are you going, men? But not even one of them paid heed to his cries, so he went up to the biggest man with the strongest voice and had him shout to rally the troops. The first Muslims were confused. Neither they nor their prophet knew where they were going. Ultimately, fewer than one percent of the twelve thousand fighters responded to the prophet's plea. Ishak. Finally, a hundred were gathered around the prophet. They confronted the enemy and fought. Their battle cries weren't for Muhammad, Allah, or even for Islam. The first cry was, Help the Ansar! And then, For the Khazraj! Looking down at the melee, as they were fighting, the prophet said, Now the oven is hot! According to Islamic tradition, which, as we know, is a precisely accurate and unbiased account, the narrator intoned with tongue firmly planted in his cheek. To body. Ali came upon them from behind, hamstrung their camels, and they fell on their rumps. He struck the enemy with such blows he cut off feet and shanks. The men fought, and by Allah, when those Muslims who had run away returned, they found only prisoners already handcuffed with the apostles. That means that a force fierce enough to make 12,000 men flee was conquered, bound, and slain by 100. Ishak, the messenger returned to Abu Sufyan, who stood fast fighting that day. He had become an excellent Muslim after embracing Islam. That means it doesn't take much Islam to turn men violent. But it's worse than that. An hour earlier, this excellent Muslim was practicing sorcery. Tabari. Muhammad turned to see Um, a pregnant woman, who said, O oh, messenger, kill those Muslims who flee from you, as you kill those who fight you, for they deserve death. Here is my dagger. If any come near me, I will rip them up and slit open their belly with it. She had listened to the Quran recitals and knew that Allah hated peaceful Muslims who retreated in battle. But Allah loves a good thief. Abu Tala took the spoils of twenty men whom he had killed. This is such a charming religion. And we know it's a religion because there are killer angels. If Islam were a political doctrine, they would be murderous comrades. Tabari and Ishak. While the men were still fighting, I saw a black striped garment descending from the sky until it dropped between us and the enemy. I gazed, and lo, it was a mass of black ants strewn everywhere which filled the valley. I had no doubt that they were angels and that the enemy would be routed. And that would make either Allah or Muhammad a liar. For Allah said, he sent down forces which you saw not. One of Muhammad's marauders boasted about how blood and booty had motivated the first Muslims. Ishak, I went up to a man and struck off his hand, and he throttled me with the other. He would have killed me if the loss of blood had not weakened him. He fell, and I killed him as soon as he was down. But I was too occupied with fighting to pay any more attention to him. So one of the Muslim Meccans passed by and stripped him. Then, when the fighting was over, and we had finished with the enemy, the apostle said that anyone who had killed a foe could have his spoil. I told the apostle that I had killed a man who was worth stripping, but I had been too busy killing others at the time to notice who had spoiled him. So Abu Bakr scolded the Muslim who had wrongly stolen the mutilated man's clothes. To all his lions who fight for his religion, go the spoils that come from their prey. Return the booty to the man who killed him. The apostle confirmed Abu Bakr's words. So I was given the property of the man whom I had killed. I sold it and bought a small palm grove with the money. It was the first property I ever owned. Sometimes I don't know if I should scream or just give up. The degree to which Islam's poison corrupts men is hard to fathom. Saving mankind from this religion will not be easy. Old hatreds die hard. Ishak, when the apostle learned that one of the Meccans had died in battle, he said, Allah curse him. He used to hate the Quraysh. All the while, Tabari, 
One of the Ansari who was plundering the slain came upon a Thakif boy. He discovered that he was an uncircumcised Christian. He uncovered others and then yelled out at the top of his voice, Allah knows that the Thakif are uncircumcised. Muslims had now killed and robbed their first Christians. This wouldn't be Islam without a sonnet to commemorate the great occasion. Ishak, Muhammad is the man, an apostle of my Lord who errs not, neither does he sin. Any who would rival him in goodness must fail. Evil was the state of our enemies, so they lost the day. Fortunes change, and we came upon them like lions from the thickets. The armies of Allah came openly, flying at them in rage, so they could not get away. We destroyed them and forced them to surrender. In the former days there was no battle like this. Their blood flowed freely. We slew them and left them in the dust. Those who escaped were choked with terror. A multitude of them were slain. This is is Allah's war in which those who do not accept Islam will have no helper. War destroyed the tribe, and fate the clan. With each word, Islam grew more violent and even more repulsive. Muhammad's disciples said that their warlord errs not, neither does he sin, that none could rival him in goodness. Deceit, sin, and evil have been redefined. It isn't a sin to fight, kill, terrorize, bear false witness, covet, or steal. And that's why the Quran and Hadith boast about such things. The second half of Abbas's poem, turned Islamic tradition, is frightening. It explains what happens to people who are victimized by Islam. The Muslims were the aggressors as they came upon them like lions. They were an army, not missionaries. Rage consumed them. The first Muslims were destructive. They forced surrender. And we know that it was Islam that had done this to them because in the former days there were no battles like this. Death was the result. Blood flowed freely. Killing meant nothing to the Muslims as they left them in the dust. The first Muslims were vicious terrorists. Those who escaped were choked with terror. A multitude were slain. And all of this death and destruction was perpetrated in the name of their despicable spirit. This is Allah's war. A second poem recited on this day was no less harsh. Ishak, in faith I do not fear the army of fate. Islam is fatalistic because Manat was the goddess of fate. He gave us the blood of their best men to drink when we led our army out against them. We were a great army with a pungent smell. We attacked continuously wherever our enemy is found. Even the most brutal, violent, and ungodly regimes to prowl our planet would have been repulsed by a god who gave us the blood of their best men to drink. You'd think such scripture would prompt a response from those who claim that today's bloodthirsty Islamic terrorists have corrupted their religion. Next we find the apostle in a heroic moment. Ishak one of our companions told us that the apostle walked past a woman whom Khalid, the perfect Islamic terrorist, had killed. He sent word to Khalid and forbade him to kill more children, women, and slaves. It's hard to sell a corpse into slavery, and this Bukhari hadith contradicts the moral message. The prophet passed by us and was asked whether it was permissible to attack infidels at night with the probability of exposing their women and children to danger. The prophet replied, Their women and children are from them. While they were out being religious, Allah's cavalry elected to terrorize the good folks of Nakla, Atas and Saad. But they began the fun by capturing and assassinating Bijad first. Ishak, Allah's apostle said, If you get hold of Bijad, don't let him escape, for he has done something evil. Tabari, while fighting the Banu Sa'd, Muslim horsemen seized Bijad. They herded his family around him like cattle and treated them roughly. 
all the while, to body. The captives of Hunayn, along with their possessions, were brought to the messenger. He ordered that their captives, animals, and their possessions be taken to Jirana and held there in custody. To commemorate their captivity, a Muslim gloated. Ishak, Allah and his servants overwhelmed every coward. Allah honored us and made our religion victorious. We were glorified in the worship of the compassionate God who destroyed them all. He humiliated them in the worship of Satan. By what our apostle recites from the book and by our swift horses, I liked the punishment the infidels received. Killing them was sweeter than drink. We galloped among them, panting for the spoil. With our loud-voiced army, the apostle squadron advanced into the fray. This stuff makes Mein Kampf seem mild. Imagine a religion saying, killing them was sweeter than drink. We galloped among them, panting for the spoil. With our loud-voiced army, the apostles' squadron advanced into the fray. Well, another Muslim sang, Ishak, crushing the heads of the infidels and splitting their skulls with sharp swords, we continually thrust and cut at the enemy. Blood gushed from their deep wounds as the battle wore them down. We conquered, bearing the prophet's fluttering standard. His war banner. Our cavalry was submerged in rising dust, and our spears quivered, but by us the prophet gained victory. Not to be outdone, another of Mohammed's companions recited some very illuminating lines. Ishak, Allah's religion is the religion of Muhammad. We are satisfied with it. It contains guidance and laws. By it he sets our affairs right. I agree with the first Muslims. Allah's religion is the religion of Muhammad. Still incriminating themselves, we read in the Sirah, Ishak, page 580. Our strong warriors obey his orders to the letter. By us, Allah's religion is undeniably strong. Islam was not spread by word of mouth, by reason, or by the kind deeds it inspired. Islam was propagated by the sword. You would think when our horses gallop with bits in their mouth that the sound of demons are among them. Mm, yes, indeed. The sounds of demons are among the Muslims when they fight jihad. Wherever Muslim militants are found, loud-mouthed demons are close at hand. The day we trod down the unbelievers, there was no deviation or turning from the apostles' order. During the battle, the people heard our exhortations to fight and the smashing of skulls by swords that sent heads flying. We severed necks with a warrior's blow. Often we left the slain cut to pieces, and a widow crying, Alas, over her mutilated husband. Tis Allah, not man, we seek to please. Just when you thought Islam couldn't get any worse, it spews ever more vitriolic violence in your face. From Sirah to Sunnah to Surah, Islam is putrid. Abbas also composed the following lines. I want you to appreciate the nature of those who, along with Muhammad, invented Islam. While Ibn Ishaq recorded a dozen pages of poetry from this day, I have tried to sift through the rubble to bring you the lines that best illuminate the mentality of these first Muslims. Ishaq we helped Allah's apostle, angry on his account, with a thousand warriors. We carried his flag on the end of our lances. We were his helpers, protecting his banner in deadly combat. We dyed it with blood, for that was its color. We were the prophet's right arm in Islam. We were his bodyguards before other troops served him. We helped him against his opponents. Allah richly rewarded that fine prophet Muhammad. Islam immortalized one of its best. The woman killing, child abusing, genocidal, tax collecting Khalid. Ishaq, since you have made Khalif chief of the army and promoted him, he has become a chief indeed, leading an army guided by Allah. 
firmly clad in mail, warriors with lances leveled. We are a strong force, not unlike a rushing torrent. We smite the wicked while we swear an oath to Muhammad, fighting in the quest of booty. Ishak, red blood flowed because of our rage. No matter the translation, no matter the interpretation, these men were as bad as their religion. Attacking, killing, enslaving, plundering, and terrorizing the housing, Takif, Nakla, Atas, and Sad villages was insufficient. Tabari, the messenger and his companions went directly to Taif. This was the town between Mecca and Yathrib, whose rabble had mocked and stoned the prophet following the Karish bargain and the satanic verses. Muhammad encamped there for a fortnight, waging war. The townsfolk fought the Muslims from behind the fort. None came out in the open. All of the surrounding people surrendered and sent their delegations to the prophet. After besieging Taif for twenty days, Muhammad left and halted at Jirana, where the captives of the Hunain were held with their women and children. It is alleged that those captives taken numbered 6,000 with women and children. Since only a hundred Muslims fought, overcoming sixty to one odds is a little far-fetched. But there is an important line in the opening hadith on the siege of Taif. The first Muslims had been so vicious that all of the surrounding people surrendered. Tabari Delegations of Hawazin came to the Prophet and embraced Islam. Therefore, he set their women and children free and decided to make the lesser pilgrimage from Jirana. Freedom had never been part of this man's vocabulary. Embracing Islam was tantamount to surrender, bowing in submission to Muhammad's authority and will. So what's up? Simple economics, actually. There were only four towns within walking distance with enough money to buy slaves, Mecca, Yathrib, Kabar, and Taif. One had been invaded, two conquered, and the fourth was undergoing siege. There simply wasn't a market. Slaves need to be sheltered, fed, and watered. They are a liability to a profiteer who has no means to trade them for money. Released of his burden, the prophet refocused his rage on Taif. After all, this had been the town whose leaders had once said, If God needed a messenger, he would have chosen somebody better than you. The Hadith reports, Tabari, Muhammad ordered that Taif's walled gardens should be torn down and destroyed. Ten years later, our boy was still hot under the collar. But his grudge batch was little more than an irritant. Ishak, the Muslims were unable to get through the city wall, for the inhabitants had shut the gate. This was as lame as the Meccans being stumped by the trench surrounding Medina. Tabari, the prophet continued to besiege the town, fighting them bitterly. Both sides shot arrows at each other until one day the wall of Taif was stormed. A number of Muhammad's companions went under a testudo. A testudo is a Roman-style siege engine with a roof. And tried to breach it, but they were showered with scraps of hot iron. They came out from under their testudo, and the Thakif shot them. Ever mean-spirited. Muhammad then ordered that their vineyards should be cut down. But all was not war and destruction. The prophet had but two of his two dozen wives, concubines, and sex slaves with him on the campaign, and he was now longing for some variety. So both the historian and the biographer tell us. Muhammad told Bakr, I saw in a dream that I was given a large bowl filled with butter. A cock pecked at it and split it. O messenger of Allah, I don't think that you will attain what you desire today. Wouldn't you just love to turn Sigmund Freud loose on that one? Anyway, that was it. The Muslim militants packed up their camels and headed home, grumbling all the way. Tabari, by Allah, I did not come to fight for nothing. I wanted a victory over Taif, so that I might obtain a slave girl from them and make her pregnant. Oh, how lovely of them. On the way back home, Ishak, 
Kab ibn Malik reacted to the apostle's decision. He said, We put an end to doubt at Kabar, but we gave our swords a rest. If our swords could have spoken, their blades would have said, Give us Das or Thakif, we will tear off the roofs in Waj. We will make homes desolate. Our cavalry will come upon you, leaving behind a tangled mass. When we assault a town, they sound a cry of alarm, but our sharp cutting swords flash like lightning. By them we bring death to those who struggle against us. Flowing blood was mingled with saffron the morn the forces met. They were taken by surprise, and we surrounded their walls with troops. Our leader, the prophet, was firm, pure of heart, steadfast, continent, straightforward, full of wisdom, knowledge, and clemency. He was not frivolous nor light-minded. We obey our prophet, and we obey a Lord who is the compassionate, the Arachman. We make you partners in peace and war. If you refuse, we will fight you doggedly. The sword of Islam has spoken. Cobb continued with these words. Ishak, our onslaught will not be a weak, faltering affair. We shall fight as long as we live. We will fight until you turn to Islam, humbly seeking refuge. We will fight not caring whom we meet. We will fight whether we destroy ancient holdings or newly gotten gains. We have cut off every opponent's nose and ears with our fine swords. We have driven them violently before us at the command of Allah and Islam. We will fight until our religion is established, and we will plunder them, for they must suffer disgrace. The oldest witness of Islam's formation, of Muhammad's words and deeds, has spoken. Nothing more need be said. This is fundamental Islam. The next poem begins as a fairy tale. It also ends as a nightmare. Ishak. Shaddad said this about the apostles' raid on Taif. Don't help a lot. One of Allah's pagan daughters. For Allah is about to destroy her. How can one who cannot help herself be helped? She was burned in black smoke and caught fire. Those who fight before her stone are outcasts. When the apostle descends on your land, none of your people will be left when he leaves. Under the heading, The division of booty captured at Hunyain, and conciliation gifts given to gain men's hearts we find that the disgruntled mercenaries needed to be appeased. Ishak, the apostle held a large number of captives. There were six thousand women and children prisoners. He had captured so many sheep and camels, they could not be counted. But since there was no market for the slaves, Muhammad asked his mercenaries to free those he had previously divvied up. Tabari, the Banu Tamim were concerned. They did not want to give up their share. So Muhammad said, He who holds a share of these captives shall get six camels for every slave of the next booty we take. They were postponing gratification. It was so mature of them. So the Muslims returned the women and children captives. But not every Mujahideen was so mature. The prophet was always an exception to his own rules. Ishak, from the captives of the Hunain, Allah's messenger gave his son-in-law, Ali, a slave girl called Baytab, and he gave future caliph Uthman, a slave girl called Zainab, and future caliph Umar, another. As the brain trust of Islam, these fellows knew that there were no babes in paradise so they got all the fornication they could handle right here on earth. Umar palmed off his prize on his son Abdallah, who scurried off to the Kaaba to pay tribute to the idol for whom he had been named. He said, I will take her when I return. But alas, the Islamic dictator said, Let her go, for her mouth is cold, her breasts are flat. You did not take her as a virgin in her prime, or even full-figured in her middle age. Even religious rapists have their standards. Still bickering, the Muslims who had followed the prophet into battle yelled, Intibadi and Ishak, 
Muhammad, divide the spoil and booty of camels and cattle among us. They forced the prophet up against a tree, and his robe was torn from him. Muhammad cried, Give me back my robe. If there had been more sheep, I would have given you some. You have not found me to be niggardly, cowardly, or false. Oh, yes, they had, which is why they had so little regard for him. We were just told, in Tabari, he had captured so many sheep and camels they could not be counted. It is little wonder, Mohammed prayed. O oh Allah, I seek refuge from you from distress and sorrow, from helplessness and laziness, from miserliness and cowardice, from being heavily in debt, and from being overcome by men. Let's think about this for a moment. Mohammed had led 12,000 armed militants against a tribe of sheep herders. They had slaughtered the men, stolen their property, and taken 6,000 women and children captive. It came time to pay the pirates their usual share from the spoil, and Mohammed reneges. He changed the rules and promised to pay them later, out of a future raid. The first Muslims became angry. They ganged up on their prophet forced him up against a tree, and tore off his robe. In response, he lied to them. Then, to memorialize the event, the warlord of the world's fastest-growing religion proclaimed that he was distressed, sorrowful, helpless, and lazy. He confessed to being a coward. Then he said that he was miserly, a death sentence if you're a pirate. No matter how many people he enslaved, or how much property he stole, he was so irresponsible, he was always broke. And while that's really bad, how can a man of God be overcome by men? As bad as this affair was for Islam's credibility, Muslim apologists cannot wish it away, for Bukhari documents it too. While Allah's apostle was on his way back from Hunyain, the Bedouin started begging for things so aggressively that they forced him to go under a Samura tree where his outer garment was snatched away. On that, Allah's apostle stood up in his undies and said, Return my clothes. If I had as many camels as these trees, I would have distributed them among you, and you will not find me a miser, liar, or coward. In what appears to be a related incident, we learn, Bukhari, while I was walking with the prophet, he was wearing a Najrani outer garment with a thick hem. A Bedouin came upon him and pulled his garment so violently that I could see the imprint of the hem on his shoulder caused by the violence of this pull. The Bedouin said, Give me something from Allah's fortune which you have. The prophet turned, smiled, and ordered that a gift should be given. Returning to the historical and biographical accounts, we find Mohammed lying to his troops and contradicting his prayer. Dabari and Ishak, you have not found me miserly, cowardly, or a liar. Then he walked over to his camel and took a hair from its hump. Holding it aloft in his fingers, he said, Men, I do not have anything of your booty, not even so much as this hair just filth, and that filth is what is being given to you. How perceptive Islam is filth. So bring back my cloak, for dishonesty will be a shame, a flame, and a doom to you. Since even his own Sunnah proves he was lying through his teeth, Muhammad must be enjoying the shame of the flame. This wrangling over stolen money continued for a number of pages. Muhammad had lost control. He was, in fact, overcome by men. Ever more desperate to buy loyalty, he doled out some of the booty his goons had stolen. But there never seemed to be enough. Ishak, the apostle gave gifts to those whose hearts were to be won over, notably the chiefs of the army, to win them and through them the people. Point, game, set, match. That about wraps it up. Muhammad used stolen property to bribe men. He, like every tyrant who has ever lived, began by greasing the palms of his generals. With a military leadership sufficiently corrupted and induced, there was nothing the people could do. Their fate was sealed, and little has changed in 1,400 years. As an interesting aside, 
The first and largest bribe listed was paid to the former Meccan chief, occultist and excellent Muslim, Abu Sufyan. But that didn't keep the troops from grumbling. The first Muslims weren't very happy with their warlord. Tabari and Ishak Kuwasira came and stood by the prophet as he was giving gifts to the people and said, Muhammad, I have seen what you have done today. Well, what did you see? he said. I don't think you have been fair. Allah's messenger became angry. Woe to you! If justice is not to be found with me, then with whom is it to be found? Might I suggest any of ten billion other choices? Umar, who got his sex toy, said, Muhammad, allow me to kill him. Ishak, the apostle said, Get him away from me and cut off his tongue. Bukhari reported the naked truth about the nature of fundamental Islam. Allah's apostle got property and war prisoners, and gave them to some people to the exclusion of others. The latter seemed to be displeased by that. The prophet said, I give to some people lest they should deviate from Islam or lose patience. Amr bin Taglib said, The statement of Allah's apostle is dearer to me than red camels. Bukhari the prophet said, I give to the Quraysh, so that they will desire Islam, for they are nearer to their life of ignorance, and it is not strong in their hearts. The term the mafia uses to describe this situation is made. A made man is someone who has participated in a criminal act like kidnap for ransom or murder for money. Made men continue to embrace the organization to keep the money coming, and to keep from being incarcerated for their crime. Another Bukhari hadith confirms that the first Muslims were nothing more than bloodthirsty pirates. It also demonstrates that there was no appreciable difference between the hadiths collected by Ishak, Tabari, or Bukhari. Bukhari when Allah favored his apostle with the properties of the Hazuin tribe as Phi Booty, he started giving to some of the Meccan men up to one hundred camels each, whereupon some Ansari said, May Allah forgive his apostle. He is giving to the Quraysh and leaving us out, in spite of the fact that our swords are still dripping with the blood of the infidels. When Muhammad was informed of what they had said, he called for the Ansar and gathered them in a leather tent. What is the statement which I have been informed, that which you have said? He meant, what did you say? The smart ones replied, O oh, Allah's apostle, the wise ones did not say anything, but the youngsters said, May Allah forgive his apostle. He enriches the Quraysh and leaves the Ansar poor, in spite of the fact that the Ansar's stores are still dripping with the blood of the infidels. The prophet replied, I give them more because they are still close to the period of infidelity and have just recently embraced Islam. You should be pleased to see them becoming rich. And the Ansar replied, Yes, O Allah's apostle, we are satisfied. The moral of the story is, you have to bribe men to make them Muslims and then threaten them to keep them that way. Bukhari, the prophet said, Every betrayer will have a flag which will be fixed to him and displayed on the day of doom. This flag will show the betrayal he committed. In other words, mess with me and you'll go to hell. This was an unpleasant time for Muhammad. He had bribed men to rob and plunder Arabs and Jews. But now the cupboard was bare. To body and Ishak. Prophet, this group of Ansar have a grudge against you for what you did with the booty and how you divided it among your own people. After due praise and exaltation of Allah, he addressed them. Ansar, what is this talk I hear from you? What is the grudge you harbor in your hearts against me? Do you think ill of me? Did I not come to you when you were erring and needy, and then made rich by Allah? It was getting nastier by the moment. There simply wasn't enough plunder to go around. And heaven forbid, a Muslim should soil his hands producing something of value. The Ansar were not satisfied. They turned the tables on the pirate king, giving him a strong dose of reality. Tabari and Ishak, 
you came to us discredited when your message was rejected by the Quraysh, and we believed you. You were forsaken and deserted, and we assisted you. You were a fugitive, and we took you in, sheltering you. You were poor in need, and we comforted you. It was all true, every word of it. Muhammad had been discredited because he had accepted the Quraysh bargain. Tempted by sex, power, and money, he had made a deal with the devil. He blasphemed his God, reciting satanic verses. His demonic message had been rejected as delusional. The Quraysh knew that Muhammad was a demon-possessed, lying charlatan, forging his scriptures by plagiarizing earlier lore. After telling the Quraysh that he was going to slaughter them, and after duping the Ansar to wage war against all mankind, Muhammad had become a fugitive. He was run out of town in shame, forsaken and deserted by his own people, his family. He was as poor as his religion. The Yathrib Arabs had foolishly comforted him, believed him, fought for him, yet none of that phased this perverted prophet. Tabari and Ishak, do you hold a grudge against me, and are you mentally disturbed because of the worldly things by which I conciliate a people and win them over so that they will embrace Islam and become Muslims? Case closed. Proof doesn't get any better than this. This is a stunning confession. Muhammad said that he used stolen property to bribe militants so that they would become Muslims. That made the first Muslims mercenaries. They were seduced and lured into Islam just as the devil had beguiled Muhammad. Islam's warlord bought support with booty. But alas, how can a pirate be a prophet? How can criminal behavior be religious? Stealing is illegal. Bribery is immoral. Venerating a man who advocates both makes one an accomplice. And trusting him with your soul is insane. Caught between a rock and some hard people, Muhammad chose the rock. Allah's apostle left town to make a lesser pilgrimage and ordered that the rest of the booty be held back, although some of the spoil followed him. There's nothing more religious than storing your contraband safely before you rush off to visit your rock god. Then, confirming the new religion was regurgitated paganism, the Sira reveals, Ishak, the people made the pilgrimage that year in the way the pagan Arabs used to do it. Listen to that again. This confirms that Islam was nothing but regurgitated paganism. Sira, page 597. The people made the pilgrimage that year in the way the pagan Arabs used to do it. With that two-line religious interlude over, it was time to return the focus to money. Now that Mohammed had admitted to being a lying miser without enough booty to go around, what do you suppose he did? He had already robbed everyone within Camel Ride, so more piracy wasn't going to work. Tabari. In this year, the messenger sent Amr to collect zakat taxes from Jafar and Amar, the clans of Julanda and Azad. And he collected the jizya from the Zoroastrians. He taxed them all. It was Muhammad's version of the New Deal. Tabari, in the same year, the 60-year-old prophet married Kilabiya. When she was given the choice between this world and the hereafter, she preferred this world. That means she rejected Islam. What's more, this hadith confirms Muhammad ignored the Quran's order not to befriend disbelievers. The tradition goes on to report, Maria, a copt child virgin, sent as a gift and then turned into a concubine, gave birth to Ibrahim. The messenger entrusted the infant to Um. Maria told Salma, a bondmaid, thus a sex slave, of the messenger, the good news. She told a Muslim who shared it with Muhammad, who in turn gave him a slave as a gift. When Maria gave birth to her son, the prophet's wives became jealous. 
Ishak. When the apostle returned to Medina after his raid on Taif, word spread that he had killed some of the men who had satirized and insulted him. The poets who were left spread in all directions. You've got to give Muhammad credit for one thing. He knew how to control the press. The next hadith speaks of short black men who used to retreat. They excited anger against them. But then the pacifists became Muslims and turned violent. Ishak, the best men launch spears as if they were swords. They peer forward unweariedly with eyes red as burning coals. They devote their lives to the prophet. On the day of hand-to-hand fighting and cavalry attacks, they purify themselves with the blood of infidels. They consider that an act of piety. Their habit is to act like lions. They are accustomed to hunting men. Good Muslims purify themselves with the blood of infidels. They are accustomed to hunting men. You don't suppose that this is what the dark spirit of Islam meant when he said, Allah is the best baptizer. With this, the curtain came down most blessedly on the eighth year of the Islamic era. We are twenty years into this scam, and it remains as ugly as its first night, the one in which Mohammed first encountered his demon. The next day was hotter than usual. It was April 20th, 630 A.D. As the sun rose, men gathered to talk about their plight. Tabari, Amr said, We have been dealt a situation from which there is no escape. You have seen what Muhammad has done. Arabs have submitted to him, and we do not have the strength to fight. You know that no herd is safe from him, and no one even dares to go outside for fear of being terrorized. Islam had arrived, and it had conquered. Anarchy was the result. It still is. So Muhammad and his less-than-inspired band of thugs set out in search of unplundered territory. Tabari, in this year the messenger carried out a military expedition to Tabuk. Tabuk was a Christian settlement in Byzantine Syria. They had done nothing to earn Muhammad's wrath. They were simply a target, the nearest untapped source of booty. Ishak, the apostle ordered Muslims to prepare for a military expedition so that he could raid the Byzantines. It would be the largest and best-equipped army Allah's messenger would ever lead. Thirty thousand militants heeded the call to arms. Muhammad proclaimed, The treasures of Caesar have been given to me by conquest. The historian Tabari, in volume 9, page 48, reveals, Muhammad wanted the people to be prepared, so he informed them that his objective was the Byzantines. The Muslims disliked the idea because of their respect for their fighting ability. But Muhammad had invested much of his last and final surah demeaning Christians and ordering Muslims to fight them, humiliate them, mutilate them, tax them, enslave them, and even crucify them. He couldn't let all of that wonderful, godly inspiration go to waste. The pirates, however, weren't so inspired. They wanted easy booty, not war. Tabari, one of the hypocrites, a peaceful former Muslim, feeling an aversion to battle, being skeptical of the truth, and spreading false rumors about Muhammad, said that they should not go out in the heat. With regard to him, Allah revealed, they said, do not march out in the heat, say, the heat of hell is far more intense. The message was nasty. Obey my order to fight and plunder, or my God will roast you in hell. Tabari, Muhammad urged the Muslims, by way of a meeting, to help cover the expenses of Allah's cause. The men provided mounts in anticipation of Allah's reward. Once again, we see that neither preaching, evangelism, nor salvation entered the picture. These men weren't off on a religious crusade. Allah's cause was armed robbery. And frankly, such behavior would be inexcusable, even if it only happened once in the presence of the Prophet or during the formation of Islam. But Muhammad's militants were in a rut. They had fought for no other reason. 
If we were to remove immoral, illegal, hateful, and violent verses from the Hadith and Quran, all we'd have left would be an odd collection of plagiarized and twisted Bible stories. Bad simply overwhelms good in Islam. To believe Muhammad is as foolish as protecting the doctrine he inspired. Ishak, the apostle always referred allusively to the destination which he intended to raid, for he said plainly that he was making for the Byzantines because the journey was long, the weather was hot, and the enemy was strong. No Byzantine had threatened Muhammad. Calling them the enemy simply confirms that all non-Muslims are Islam's foe. But there is another lesson here. Today, Muslims scream with shrill voices that the Christian crusaders attacked Muslims without provocation. Yet their own scriptures confirm that Islam drew first blood and that Muslims invaded and conquered Christians. But it's worse than that. Christianity had permeated what is now Iraq. Iran, Turkey, Syria, Jordan, Israel, and Egypt, by the time Mohammed decided to plunder these people. The Messiah's message appealed to human hearts and minds by virtue of his words. Within a decade of the Tabuk raid, Islam would lay all of that to ruin, attacking, conquering, and taxing the once free people who occupied these places. Islam imposed its will by violent assault. On this day, Muhammad discovered that even after promising Allah would reward Muslims with booty beyond their dreams, most Arabs were skeptical. Tabari, when the Prophet was prepared to set off, a number of Muslims whose intentions had prevented them from following the messenger lagged behind without any misgivings. Those who knew Muhammad much better than we do recognized the obvious. There was no doubt in their mind that Islam's founder was a money-grubbing con, a mean-spirited thug who was out for himself. Here's an example, up close and personal. Ishak, Jod told Muhammad, Will you allow me to stay behind and not tempt me? Everyone knows that I am strongly addicted to women. I'm afraid that I'll see Byzantine women and will not be able to control myself. This suggests that Muhammad tempted Muslims to fight, and that he offered them captured women as booty. The apostle gave him permission to remain behind. In other words, Muhammad didn't want the competition. It was about him that Allah sent down, There are some who say, Give me leave to stay behind and do not tempt me. Surely they have fallen into temptation already, and hell encompasses these unbelievers. This became Quran 9.49. It was not that he feared the temptation from the Byzantine women. The temptation he had fallen into was greater in that he had hung back from the apostle and sought to please himself rather than Muhammad. Verily, hell awaits him. There are three messages here, and all are bad. Being tempted to rape is a lesser offense than being a pacifist. The highest calling in Islam is to please Muhammad. And, if you don't fight, you go to hell. If you are a peaceful Muslim, your God hates you, and he wants to punish you. Ishak, one of the estranged ones, said to another, Don't go out to fight in this heat. He disliked strenuous war, doubted the truth, and created misgivings about the apostle. So Allah sent down regarding them, and they said, Do not go out in this heat. Say, the fires of hell are hotter. Let them laugh a little for now, and they will weep a great deal later as reward for what they did. You will find this gem buried in the 82nd verse of The Feast, Sirah. A related hadith says, Ishak, some Bedouins came to apologize for not going into battle, but Allah would not accept their excuses. Ishak, the apostle went forward energetically with his preparations and ordered the men to get ready with all speed. He urged Muslims to help provide the money, mounts, and means to do Allah's work. Those who contributed earned rewards with Allah. This is why Islamic despots like the Saudi warlords fund terrorism. But those who have tried to cash in their reward 
aren't happy with the deal they've struck. Like all pirates, Mohammed had to constantly watch his backside. To Bari, Ali seized his weapons and set off until he caught up with Muhammad. The hypocrites allege that you left me behind because you found me burdensome and wanted to get rid of me, he replied. They lied. I left you behind because of what I have left behind. So go back and represent me in my family. The kind of men who were willing to rob were just as likely to pick his pockets. So the pirate king told his son and son-in-law, Don't let them steal my booty or my babes. The first Muslims didn't care much for the prophet's company. Tabari. The messenger continued his march, but his men began to fall behind. The prophet said, Leave them, for if there is any good in any of them, Allah will unite them with the rest of his pirates. If not, Allah has relieved you of them. So the quasi-peaceful Muslims died of exposure, hunger, and thirst. Tabari. A band of hypocrites going along with the prophet as he was marching towards Tabuk said, Do you think that fighting these people will be like the others we have fought? It looks to me as if we will be tied with ropes tomorrow. They said this in order to intimidate and frighten the faithful. But then they said, Every one of us would rather be flogged a hundred lashes to escape Allah revealing a verse about us and what we have said. One of the Muslim snitches ratted out these men to his general. So the chief pirate turned in his saddle and confronted the bad Muslims. They protested, O oh, prophet, we were simply playing and speaking nonsense. Then Allah sent down a Quran about them. If you question them, then assuredly they will say, We were only speaking nonsense and playing. Quran 965 Ishaq Abd al-Rahman, the man for whom the Quran had been sent down, said, O oh, Apostle, my name disgraces me. The rock idol al-Rahman was no longer in vogue. And that's one more proof that al-Rahman was not merely a title or an attribute for Allah. But this wasn't a game to Muhammad. It was a scam. He had business to conduct. To body. When the messenger reached Tabuk, the governor of Ela a seaport at the north end of the Gulf of Aqaba, came to him, made a treaty, and agreed to pay the jizya tax. The people of Jarba and Adrun also offered to pay him the tax. It was Muhammad's favorite verse, Give me the money. Not a word was spoken about summoning them to Islam. Muhammad wasn't out with his troops being religious. He didn't bother calling the lost heathens to faith. He just wanted their money. This man wasn't a prophet. He was a pirate. His scam had become what Khadija envisioned, the profitable profit plan. The Kaaba Inc. was now paying dividends. As an interesting aside, the place where Mohammed now found himself was in the shadows of the real Mount Horeb, the mountain in which Moses had received the Torah. And yet Mohammed was oblivious. This prophet summoned additional village leaders to make their contributions, some, according to Dabadi and Ishak, encountered the messenger's cavalry, which was led by Khalid. Ukeder was seized, and his brother Hassan was killed. Hassan was wearing a silk brocade gown woven with gold in the form of palm trees. Khalid stripped him of it and sent it to Muhammad. When it arrived, the Muslims felt it with their hands, admiring it. They felt no remorse for the man whose blood they had spilled upon it. They were fundamentalist Muslims, and Islam had corrupted them with words like these. The prophet said, Are you amazed at it? The kerchiefs in paradise are better than this. He, like Hitler, was incapable of pity. Later, Khalid brought Ukader to Muhammad. He spared his life and made peace with him on condition that he pay the zakat tax. Mission accomplished. They left Tabuk and returned to Medina. Tabari. On the way, Muhammad ordered that whoever got to the well before him should not drink until he arrived. Some of the hypocrites arrived and drew water. The prophet cursed them and invoked Allah's curse on them. Nurturing the flock wasn't part of his job description. The translator of Volume 9 of the History of Al-Tabari, The Last Years of the Prophet, 
inserted a footnote here to make certain we understood the nature of these expeditions. Quote, the term Seria is applied to an army sent out by the prophet in contradistinction to Gazwa or Magazi, meaning a raiding party wherein the prophet himself participates. End quote. You've got to question a religion that has words for things like this. Bukhari. I heard Kab bin Malik narrating the story of the Gazwa in Tabuk, in which he failed to take part. Kab said, I did not abandon Allah's apostle in any Gazwa he fought, except the Tabuk raid. I failed to take part in the Gazwa of Badar, but Allah did not admonish anyone who had not participated in it, for in fact Allah's apostle had only gone out in search of the Quraysh caravan. I witnessed the night of al Aqaba with Allah's apostle when we pledged to war against all mankind for Islam, and I would not exchange it for the Badar battle, although Badar is more popular among Muslims than the Pledge. As for my news in this battle of Tabuk, I had never been stronger or wealthier than I was when I was with the Prophet in Ghazwaz. This is a wonderful summation of Islam. The Bukhari tradition continues with, when I heard that the prophet was on his way back to Medina, I got concerned and began to think of false excuses, saying to myself, How can I avoid his anger? Those who had failed to join the battle of Tabuk came and started offering excuses. There were more than eighty men from whom Allah's apostle accepted excuses. Then he took their pledge of allegiance. When I came, he smiled a smile of an angry person, and then said, What stopped you from joining? Joining us, Had you not purchased an animal for carrying you? I answered, yes, but... The prophet and his militants treated Cobb like a pariah, banishing him from the community. They said of the twice peaceful Muslim, We never witnessed you sinning like this before. Then... Allah's apostle forbade all Muslims from talking to him. Cobb said, I used to go out and pray with the Muslims and roam the markets, but no one would talk to me. This harsh attitude of the people lasted for a long time. Even my cousin, who was the dearest person to me, did not return my greetings. Thereupon my eyes flowed with tears. It's no fun being a peaceful Muslim. Muhammad and his militants make Osama bin Laden's al-Qaeda gang look like Boy Scouts. Dabari, Hatim said, Adi, whatever you were going to do before Muhammad's cavalry descended upon us, do it now, for I have seen the banners of his army. When the Islamic cavalry left the settlement, they took Hatim's daughter along with other captives. She was brought to the messenger with slaves from Ta'i. He put her in an enclosure by the door of his mosque, where the captives were detained. The mosque was now a prison, a symbol of Muhammad's power and control, not of his religion or faith. This woman was a rape victim in waiting. Sounding a lot like a Nazi propagandist, Hitler's Goebbels perhaps, a fundamentalist Muslim laid out Islam's agenda. Tabari Arabs are the most noble people in lineage, the most prominent, the best in deeds. We were the first to respond to the Prophet's call. We are Allah's helpers and the viziers of his messenger. We fight people until they believe in Allah. He who believes in Allah and his messenger has protected his life and possessions from us. As for those who disbelieve, we will fight them forever in the cause of Allah, and killing them is a small matter to us. Peace be unto you. These are terrifying words, words that should be shouted from every political rostrum, from every pulpit, and into every microphone. This man had not corrupted Islam. Islam had corrupted him. Any doctrine that, when properly implemented, inspires such loathing, looting, and lunacy cannot be tolerated. Until Islam is held responsible for the carnage it inspires, terror will continue the world over. Killing is a small matter to them. Tabari dictates another nine pages to the ninth year of the Islamic era. They focus on a single theme, money. Tabari, 
Indeed, Allah has guided you with his guidance. If you do well, capture booty, obey Allah and his messenger. You must perform the prayers, pay the zakat tax, and give a fifth share of Allah's booty to his messenger. The required zakat is, from the land one-tenth of that watered by springs and rain, one-twentieth of that watered by the leathern bucket, from camels, a milch camel for every forty camels, a young male camel for every thirty camels, from sheep, one of every five camels, and from cows, one from every fourth. If anyone pays more, it is to his credit. He who professes this bears witness to his Islam and helps the faithful fight against the polytheists. He has the protection of Allah and his messenger. It was the Prophet's pay-me-now and pay-me-later plan. Muhammad used terrorism to confiscate property. Then he used Islam to force his victims into submission, so that he could tax them. The zakat continues to be an asset-based tax of 5 to 10 percent imposed annually on Muslims. In addition, they are required to give up one-fifth of any booty they steal in the name of Islam, Bonus points are awarded for additional contributions to the ongoing war effort, Islamic imperialism. So long as Muslims pay, they have nothing to fear. If they don't, everything is confiscated, and the niggardly Muslim is exterminated. Lenin, Mao, and Hitler imposed a similar regimen. Now that Mohammed has fleeced his flock, it was time to plunder the infidels. Tabari. He who holds fast to his religion, Judaism, or Christianity is not to be tempted from it. Now, why do you think that might be? Since Muhammad and his God have said that Christian and Jewish unbelievers are the faggots of Allah's hellfire, why not tempt them from their torturous fate? What could be more important to a pirate, I mean profiteer, excuse me, prophet, than souls? It is incumbent upon them to pay the jizya, protection tax, for every adult, male or female, free or slave, one full denarius, over four grams of gold, or its value in fine cloth. He who pays that to the messenger has the protection of Allah and his messenger, and he who holds back from it is the enemy of Allah and his messenger. Sheep were good. Camels were better, but when it came to becoming Mohammed's pal, nothing beat the glitter of gold. Al Capone, like the Prophet Mohammed, said, Pay me and I'll protect you from me. As with the Mafia, it was all about armed robbery. The infidel Jizya tax was imposed at a much higher rate than the Muslim Zakat. Mohammed didn't want non-Muslims tempted because it would lower his income. In the choice between religion and revenue, Muhammad had chosen money. During debates with Islamic clerics, I often point out that Muslims were only tolerant because the jizya was more lucrative than the zakat. Well, they don't dispute that, as it would make their prophet and god liars as opposed to being pirates. They protest that the infidel tax was for their protection. Protection from whom? I ask, without response. Yet they know that the protection was from the sword of Islam, as the preceding hadith confirms. The rules of the game were straightforward. He who holds back from paying is the enemy of Allah and his messenger. If Christians and Jews copped up the jizya, they got to keep their heads. It was tolerance, Islam style. Before we press on, I'd like to highlight Muhammad's choice of words. Jews and Christians unlike Muslims, weren't to be tempted. By selecting this word, the Prophet corroborated my theory. Muslims were seduced into Islam with the same temptations that ensnared Muhammad, sex, power, and money. Tabari, the messenger has sent Zura and his companions to you. I commend them to your care. Collect the zakat and jizya from your districts, and hand the money over to my messengers. The Prophet is the master of your rich and your poor. Muhammad's use of messengers was in perfect harmony with the profitable Prophet plan. 
His view of himself as master is cooperation of his unquenchable lust for power. And this message repudiates his claim of being a biblical prophet in the line of Moses. Real prophets were neither tax collectors nor masters. Muhammad said, In Tabari, Malik has reported to me that you were the first from Himyar to embrace Islam, and that you have killed infidels, so rejoice at your good fortune. Embrace Islam, kill, then rejoice. It's the quid pro quo of Muslim militancy. It is the reason the Muslim world celebrates death and honors murderers. But Islam wasn't all money-grubbing, power-coveting, murderous terror. It was about discrimination, too. Tabari, no polytheist shall come near the holy mosque, and no one shall circumambulate Allah's house naked. Never mind that the pagans built the Kaaba, that it was a shrine for polytheists, or that each of the pagan rites and rituals they observed were incorporated into Islam, Polytheists were no longer welcome under the big tent of the new and improved religion. Tabari, in this year the zakat was made obligatory, and the messenger dispatched his agents to collect it. The verse was revealed, take the zakat tax from their wealth to purify them. Allah was always ready with the perfect scripture revelation for whatever his prophet craved. It's hard to find a God like that. It's also hard to imagine a dogma so transparent it calls stealing purification. The polygious doctrine of submission laid down the law. On April 8, 631 A.D., Dimon, in the prophet's presence, prioritized Tabari, the obligatory acts of Islam one by one, the zakat tax, fasting, pilgrimage, and all the sunnah, or laws of the prophet. Money was number one, and acknowledging Allah didn't even make the list. Muhammad wouldn't be the peace-loving founder of the tolerant and inclusive religion of Islam if he didn't terrorize somebody at the beginning of his final year. Tabari, the messenger sent Killer Khalid with an army of four hundred to Harith, a South Arabian tribe, and ordered him to invite them to Islam for three days before he fought them. If they were to respond and submit, he was to teach them the Book of Allah, the Sunnah of his Prophet, and the requirements of Islam, which are to pay Muhammad the money. If they should decline, then he was to fight them. Submit or die, Muhammad's Islam wasn't the least bit ambiguous, nor was this messenger. Khalid was the Islamic militant who had bound and butchered an entire Arab tribe after promising them peace. Muhammad pretended to separate himself from the senseless slaughter of innocent families with an ostentatious public prayer. Yet the Prophet never repudiated Khalid's behavior. He never refused the booty Khalid collected or refrained from sending the terrorist tax collector out on subsequent raids. The Sunnah of the Prophet, described in these last two traditions, is nothing more than the use of Muhammad's example, his words and his deeds, to establish ideal Islamic behavior. The Sunnah codifies religious rituals, customs, taxation, and law. This is the Hadith's parallel of the 33rd Surah, in which Allah commands Muslims to emulate Muhammad's example. The sole repository of these virtuous Islamic behaviors and words is in the Hadith, and only four collections are credible, Ishaq, Bukhari, Tabari, and Muslim, all tracing back to within 300 years of the Prophet's death. By way of confirmation, the Islamic scholar who translated Muslim's Hadith wrote, Sahih Muslim is a collection of the sayings and deeds of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be unto him. It is known as the Sunnah. These reports of the Prophet's sayings and deeds are called Hadith. 
Muslim lived a couple of centuries after the Prophet's death and worked hard to collect his hadith. Each report in his collection was checked for compatibility with the Quran. The veracity of the chain of reporters, called an iznad, had to be painstakingly established. Muslims' collection is recognized by the overwhelming majority of the Muslim world to be one of the most authentic collections of the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad. Peace be unto him. Muslim scholars and imams alike claim that the heinous deeds and immoral words which comprise the Sunnah were inspired by Allah. That makes the Hadith scripture. That means that pedophilia, incest, polygamy, fornication, rape, deceit, seduction, indoctrination, thievery, the slave trade, racism, fighting, piracy, bribery, intolerance, political assassination, mass murder, and, of course, terrorism, are authorized Sunnah. The only approved Islamic behaviors. As such, all good Muslims are bad people. To be a good person, one has to be a bad Muslim or a non-Muslim. There are no exceptions. If you believe the world needs more good Muslim rapists who conquer, plunder, terrorize, and murder while indoctrinating others to act in like fashion, continue to ignore the third commandment and tolerate Islam's existence. But if you believe these behaviors will lead to death and damnation, you may want to heed the words Yahweh etched in stone 3,200 years ago. Quote, you shall not accept or tolerate in the name or character of Yahweh, your deity, anything that is false, deceptive, or destructive. I suggest we follow his advice. In the last year of Muhammad's life, the wannabe prophet turned parasitic terrorist began to sense his mortality. He had more sex, money, and power than he could handle. The only thing left was immortality. So the most vile man who ever lived commanded that his sunnah, or example, be imposed upon the world by force of arms. The 1,400-year-long river of blood that flowed from Medina is the result. Tabari, the messenger commanded me, and I sent riders announcing, Arabs, embrace Islam, and you will be safe. They surrendered and did not fight. I stayed, ordering them to fulfill the requirements of Islam. Then to make certain no one would errantly accept Islam out of some misguided notion that it was a religion inspired by God rather than simply one man's quest for sex, power, and money, Muhammad proclaimed, Tabari, none but the purified shall touch the Quran. Therefore, 100% of Muslims were compelled into Islam by the sword, or they were seduced by some errant interpretation. Allah's revelation persuaded no one. And I believe that's true today. Very few Muslims understand what the Quran actually says. Fewer still know the Sunnah, as presented by the first Hadith collectors, Ishaq, Tabari, Bukhari, and Muslim. And that's both good and bad. Good people, exposed to the truth, will reject Muhammad and discard Islam. That's good. But bad people continue to use the polygious doctrine as it was conceived for their own gain. Tabari, give the people the good news. Virgins and gluttony and paradise and the way to attain it. By killing Christians and Jews. Warn them of the hell fire and the way to earn it. By being peaceful. Teach them the rights of the pagan pilgrimage, its practices, its obligations, that I usurped from Kusay. And what Allah has commanded about the Hajj and Umrah, He orders you to offer prayer at the appropriate times, with proper bowing and humility. He orders you to give one-fifth of Allah's booty and to pay the zakat tax. It is enjoined on the faithful from their land and property. And don't seduce the Jews or Christians, for incumbent upon them is to pay the jizya protection tax. You just can't beat good old-fashioned religion for robbing and controlling folks. Allah's apostle dispersed his representatives to every land where Islam had entered to collect the zakat. Muhammad has done a fine job of proving that Islam created a license to steal. 
there is no reason to call the profitable profit plan a theory anymore. Religion is the damnation of mankind. Its rituals are an opiate deadening the mind, but it's worse than that. Religion is the most powerful and seductive control mechanism ever conceived. From the first religion instituted in Nimrod's Babylon to that imposed by the Egyptians, Assyrians, Greeks, Romans, Catholics, Muslims, Nazis, and Communists, religious doctrines have been the source of power, control, and wealth for cleric and king. Religions have been the impetus and excuse for thievery and for war. While Islam is the worst of a bad lot, most are without merit. The religions of man have served to separate men and women from freedom, prosperity, and from God. For another lesson in fundamental Islam, we find Tabati, Volume 9, page 88, saying, Abdallah Azdi came to the messenger, embraced Islam, and became a good Muslim. Allah's apostle invested Azdi with authority over those who had surrendered, and ordered him to fight the infidels from the tribes of Yemen. Azdi left with an army by the messenger's command. The Muslims besieged them for a month. Then they withdrew, setting a trap. When the Yemenites went in pursuit, Azdi was able to inflict a heavy loss on them. Muhammad said a good Muslim is a jihad fighter. And Azdi showed that a little Islam goes a long way. Skimming over the next twenty pages of Al-Tabadi, we find Arabs poking fun and pretending to be Muhammad. In jest they revealed surahs in rhyming speech, imitating the Quran. They even made paradise on earth, permitting fornication and the drinking of wine. Others were out playing Allah, trashing men with prescribed punishments and lashings. Lots of folks were deputized became good Muslims and coerced others into submission. Armies marched, skirmishes were fought, men were killed or banished, cattle were stolen, and young girls were captured and turned into slaves. There was even talk of sorcerers and casting evil spells. One must have worked because Tabari, Allah sent a thunderbolt which scorched a man and his camel. Tabari, when Allah's messenger returned to Medina after performing the hajj of perfection in religion, he began to have a complaint of illness. What do you suppose it was? Gluttony? Venereal disease? Or a dead conscience? News of the Prophet's illness spread. So Musa Lima, a Yemeni messenger, virtually identical to Muhammad religiously, leapt at the opportunity to claim the prophethood for himself. Abu Bakr would ultimately slaughter the Yemenites in the war of compulsion, but for now the Muslims were content to rob them. Tabari, Ali returned from Yemen with an army dressed in white linen to meet Muhammad. But the sexy uniforms were stolen, thus they were technically part of the Yemeni booty. So they were stripped off the soldiers who had stolen them and were thrown back into the rest of the confiscated treasure. That brings us to Muhammad's farewell sermon. Like the rest of Islam, it was a far cry from the Messiah's Sermon on the Mount. In the opening stanza, the prophet tried to justify removing the intercalating month. Then, in the most important and revealing line Muhammad ever spoke, he said, Tabari, beware of Satan in your religion. Proving that Islam could be as brutal as any occult doctrine, the sexist proclaimed, Tabari, you have a right over your wives, and they have a right over you. You have the right that they should not cause anyone of whom you dislike to tread your beds, and that they should not commit any open indecency. If they do, then Allah permits you to shut them in separate rooms and to beat them, but not severely. And if they abstain from evil, they have the right to food and clothing. Treat women well, for they are like domestic animals with you, and they do not possess anything themselves. Allah has made the enjoyment of their bodies lawful in his Quran. As you might expect, whatever minimal rights women might have had in Islam didn't make the list. The abused boy had become an abuser. Women would pay for abandoning him as a child. With this speech, Muhammad condemned over a billion people. 
Husbands have been told that their wives are their possessions, worth no more than a domesticated animal. Men can beat women. They can strip them and lock them up in a closet. Husbands only have to feed their wives if they behave. A Muslim hadith confirms Muhammad's contempt. O oh, women folk, you should ask for forgiveness, for I saw you in bulk among the dwellers of hell. A wise lady said, Why is it, Allah's apostle, that women comprise the bulk of the inhabitants of hell? The prophet observed, You curse too much and are ungrateful to your spouses. You lack common sense, fail in religion, and rob the wisdom of the wise. Upon this the woman remarked, What's wrong with our common sense? The prophet replied, Your lack of common sense can be determined from the fact that the evidence of two women is equal to one man. That is a proof. The Quran says that the testimony of a woman, as well as their value, is half that of a man. And the Hadith claims that Allah made women stupid. Well, stupid, no. Wrong, yes. Women endure hellish lives in Islam, yet most non-Muslim women simply ignore their plight. Across America, hundreds of thousands of women have been seduced into Islam. It's presented as a way to rebel against Judeo-Christianity and the godless depravity of the media culture. Yet these women know nothing of Muhammad's life and are offended when I read from the Quran and Hadith. The fundamental precepts of the Sunnah are completely alien to them. The nature of jihad and the Prophet's life don't mesh with the politically correct veneer that has been used to beguile the media and the masses. So where is the public outcry against this deception, against this bigotry and abuse? I find the following words outrageous, and I'm surprised that no one else seems to care. Bukhari. The Prophet said, Isn't the witness of a woman equal to half that of a man? The woman said, Yes. He said, This is because of the deficiency of a woman's mind. Ishak. Tell the men with you who have wives, never trust a woman. Every aspect of Islam is rotten. It's repulsive, racist, sexist, and unforgivably violent. Islam is the most lethal form of religious poison ever conceived. Yet it's simplistic. It's amazing that something this infantile could wreak such havoc. To body. The messenger completed the pilgrimage, showing the people its rites, and taught them what was required of them, including the stations, the throwing of pebbles, the running around the Kaaba, and what Allah had permitted them to do. Like beating their wives, killing infidels, and stealing booty. And what he had forbidden. Like being tolerant, like not sharing the booty, and withholding the tax. The pilgrimage, the rites, the stations, the throwing of pebbles, and the circumambulation were all part of Kusay's pagan scam, and the other requirements, fighting and sharing booty, were brutal and immoral. As the aged prophet was petering out, his companions wanted an accurate accounting of the things that mattered most to Muhammad. The next twenty-seven pages of Al-Tabadi's history are dedicated to counting the number of terrorist raids the prophet personally led those he simply commissioned, the people he had assassinated, the times he had humbled the Meccans with his presence, and the number of wives, concubines, and sex slaves in his harem. Tabari, Ishak, Bukhari, and Muslim all cover the same material. But so as to provide a sense of proportion, I'm going to stick with one account, and I'm going to cover this summation in the order it was reported. Tabari the military expeditions, the Ghazwat, in which the messenger personally participated, were 26. Some say they were 27. The victims are listed in the order they were abused, which is quite puzzling to me. If Muslims can remember exactly who they robbed and when they robbed them, but can't remember what comprised a surah or when it was revealed, what does it say about their priorities? Tabari. The armies and raiding parties sent by the messenger of Allah between the time he came to Medina and his death, ten years, was thirty-five. This rather chilling admission is followed by another detailed and chronological listing of tribes. But there was no unanimity of opinion, 
a subsequent hadith claims the armies and raiding parties sent by the messenger were 48 when you add the number of raids the prophet led to the number he sent the total becomes alarming in just over 100 months he instigated 75 assaults combined with the three dozen men and women he specifically ordered his militants to assassinate it adds up to at least one slain or mass murder for each month Muhammad ruled during the Islamic era. That makes the Prophet the most successful Muslim terrorist of all time. Peace be unto him. And he wasn't through. After assassinating Yasser, a Jew from Kabar, by severing his leg and letting him bleed to death, the Prophet sent his Islamic commandos out to slay another. Tabari. The messenger called me and said, I suspect that Khalid Sufyan is going to attack me, so go to him and kill him. O oh, prophet, describe him to me so that I might know him. He said, When you see him, he will remind you of Satan. Which is to say, he will look, act, and talk like Mohammed. Demonstrating the traits of a good Muslim, the assassin managed to track his victim down, pray, and then murder him in front of his wife and daughters. Tabari, when it was feasible for me, I struck him with my sword and killed him. Then I departed, leaving his women to throw themselves at him. When I returned to the prophet, he asked, Is your mission accomplished? Yes, I have killed him. Islam might be a religion after all. Muhammad's henchman was on a mission. Following more assassinations, there are additional raids. Tabari, Muhammad sent Uyena to raid the Banu Anbar. They killed some people and took others captive. Asma was one of the women taken prisoner. It was all in a day's work, part of the rites and rituals of Islam. Tabari, Muhammad sent an expedition to Galib and to the land of the Banu Mura. The expedition of Amr and Ali was sent to the valley of Edom. Another sent by Aslami was sent to Gaba, and Abd al-Rahman was ordered by the messenger to lead an army to the seashore. I'm going to assume that these terrorist attacks were included in the original 75. It's enough already. Tabari, the messenger of Allah married 15 women. He combined 11 at a time and left behind 9. This, of course, does not include rape victims, concubines, and sex slaves, but it does include pedophilia and incest. Speaking of pedophilia, Ishak, the apostle saw Umal when she was a baby crawling before his feet and said, If she grows up, I will marry her, but he died before he was able to do so. Tabari, Asha, when he married her, was very young and not yet ready for consummation. Tabari. Bakr married Aisha to Muhammad when she was only six years old. Tabari. My mother came to me when I was being swung on a swing between two branches and got me down. My nurse wiped my face with some water and started leading me. When I was at the door, she stopped so I could catch my breath. I was then brought in while the messenger was sitting on a bed in our house. My mother made me sit on his lap. Then the men and women got up and left. The Prophet consummated his marriage with me in my house when I was nine years old. Most rational people would prefer to get their spiritual inspiration from someone who isn't a sexual predator and pervert. Some of the lowlights of the stallion's conquest included in Al-Tabadi, Volume 9, starting on page 133 and running through 137, include... Juwariya was chosen by the messenger for himself on the day of the Murasi raid from the captives. Muhammad married Um, who had embraced Christianity. Muhammad took Zainab, his daughter-in-law. But Allah did not find any fault in the incestuous relationship and ordered the marriage. When the prophet scrutinized the captives on the day of Kabar, he threw his cloak over Safia. She was his chosen one. The messenger married Ghazia after the news of her beauty and skill had reached him. Allah granted Reina of the Jewish Kareza to his messenger as booty. But only after she had been forced to watch him decapitate her father and brother, seeing her mother hauled off to be raped and her sisters sold into slavery. 
Maria, a copt slave, was presented to the prophet. She was given to him by Mukawis, the ruler of Alexandria. Muhammad was despicable. Tabari. The prophet married Alia, a Bakr woman. He gave her gifts for divorce and left her. He also married Kutela, but he died before he could consummate the marriage. Layla approached the prophet while his back was to the sun and clapped him on his shoulder. He asked who it was, and she replied, I am the daughter of one who competes with the wind. I am Layla. I have come to offer myself to you. He replied, I accept. Layla scampered back home and shared her story with Mommy and Daddy. They said, What a bad thing you have done. You are a self-respecting girl, but the prophet is a womanizer. Now, there's an understatement. The next half-dozen pages provide an accounting of Muhammad's slaves. For example, A eunuch named Muber was presented to Muhammad along with two slave girls. One he took as a concubine, the other he gave to Hassan. There are twenty-two pages devoted to the collection of the zakat and jizya taxes in this summation of Islam's formation. Twenty-seven pages of accounting notes dedicated to terrorist raids. Sixteen pages chronicling the Prophet's sexual perversity. Yet there is only one paragraph devoted to scribes. Since Muhammad was illiterate, and since the Quran was supposed to be his miraculous gift from Allah to mankind, how is it that writing scripture received eighty-eight times less attention than money? one hundred and eight times less attention than terrorist raids, or sixty-four times less attention than sex. Well, it's because Islam wasn't about saving souls. It was always about power, sex, and money. Collectively, these things were two hundred and sixty times more important than Scripture. It's something to think about if you are a Muslim. As an interesting aside to Muhammad's scribes, we discovered earlier that one of them, Abdallah bin Sa'd, had quite a story. He was the first person who attempted to commit Quranic revelations to parchment while they were still fresh in Muhammad's mind. According to the Hadith, he became concerned because some of the phraseology didn't sound godly, so he suggested enhancements to Muhammad. When Muhammad accepted his edits, Abdallah rejected Islam. He recognized that the Quran couldn't be from God if he, a lowly scribe, could copy edit it. But the story didn't end there. Abdallah had a secret Muhammad had to conceal. If word got out that he was just making this stuff up as he went along, he would lose everything he had struggled to gain. So, Tabari, when the messenger entered Mecca, he ordered that the following men should be killed, even if they were under the Kaaba. First among them was Abdallah bin Sa'd. Al-Tabadi's hadiths go on to invest twenty-five times more ink to pet names Muhammad ascribed to his possessions than to memorializing the Quran. We are regaled with the monikers of his horses, his mules, his camels, sheep, swords, bows, lances, coats of mail, and shields. This list climaxes with the Prophet's names for himself. With his insecurities showing, he said, Tabari, the messenger of Allah named himself to us in various ways. He said, I am Muhammad, the one who is praised, Ahmad, the most praiseworthy, Al-Aqib, the last in succession, and Al-Mahi, the obliterator. They go from bad to worse. The following physical description sounds more like an ape than a man. Tabari, the messenger was neither tall nor short. He had a large head and beard with big black eyes. His palms and feet were calloused. He had large joints. His face was white with a reddish tinge. His chest hair was long. And when he walked, he bent forward as if he were descending a slope. Maybe Muhammad misspoke when he said that Allah transformed Jews into monkeys. For those in the nation of Islam, trying to seduce disgruntled young black men by claiming that Muhammad was a man of color, the next hadith is devastating. Tabari, he was a white man. Muhammad's seal of prophethood was as ugly as his scripture, 
We have this from a pair of Abus. Tabari. The messenger said, O oh, Abu Zayed, come close to me and wipe my back. I put my finger on the seal and touched it. The seal was a collection of hairs on his shoulders. I asked Abu Sayyid about the seal which the prophet had, and he said that it was like a protruding lump of flesh. With the prophet's career summarized and his attributes documented, it's time we take a final look at the man who mirrored his character and his mission. Only miles and years distinguished Hitler from his mentor. The Fuhrer's methods for accomplishing his madness were identical to the Prophet's. We read this in Mein Kampf 676. Spiritual terror, men must threaten and dominate men by compulsion. Compulsion is only broken by compulsion, and terror broken by terror. On the road to power, compulsion follows seduction and the lever that coerces compulsion is terror. Hitler simply followed Mohammed's path. Bukhari, Allah's apostle said, I have been made victorious with terror. Mein Kampf 677 Since our view of life will never share power with another, it cannot cooperate with the existing doctrines it condemns. It is obliged to fight for all available means until the entire world of hostile ideas collapses. Throughout the entirety of the Islamic era, we have heard a singular battle cry. Bukhari, our prophet, the messenger of our Lord, ordered us to fight you until you worship Allah alone. Both men envisioned an everlasting battle and total submission. Mein Kampf 677 this corrosive fight for the new program and for the new view of life demands determined fighters and a forceful fighting organization. The recipe for a favorable result requires the formulation of a declaration of war against all existing orders and against all existing conceptions of life in general. Just like Islam, it was the Nazis against the world. The house of Islam forever battles the house of war. Tabari, he who believes in Allah and his messenger has protected his life and possessions from us. As for those who disbelieve, we will fight them forever in the cause of Allah. Killing them is a small matter to us. The Nazis usurped Mohammed's dogma. The recipe of submit and obey was perfect for empowering their tyrant. Mein Kampf 679 the strength of a party lies in the disciplined obedience of the members to follow their leadership. The decisive factors are leadership and discipline. When troops battle one another, the victorious one will be that which is blindly obedient to the superior leader. Islam says, Ishak, the best men launch spears as if they were swords. They peer forward unweariedly. They devote their lives to the prophet. In hand-to-hand -hand fighting and cavalry attacks, they purify themselves with the blood of the infidels. They consider that an act of piety. It's hard to distinguish which polygious doctrine was more fixated on violence. Mein Kampf 680. In order to lead a view of life to victory, we have to transform it into a fighting movement. Ishak. Our onslaught will not be a weak, faltering affair. We shall fight as long as we live. We will fight until you turn to Islam, humbly seeking refuge. We will fight not caring whom we meet. We will fight whether we destroy ancient holdings or newly gotten gains. We have cut off every opponent's nose and ears with our swords. We have driven them violently before us at the command of Allah and Islam. We will fight until our religion is established, and we will plunder them, for they must suffer disgrace. Like Mohammed, Hitler seduced men before he coerced them. He made promises, but he never delivered. Mein Kampf 683 The party with its program of 25 points is unshakable. Ten of the 25 Nazi pillars were financial inducements, bribes if you will. Twelve were control mechanisms, three were focused on fighting. The following Islamic concepts made Hitler's list in Mein Kampf. Abrogation, duty, annulment of treaties, the confiscation of war booty, profit sharing or distribution of spoils, the party's cut or fifth, 
conquest, expulsion of non-believers, alms or pensions for believers, Jewish businesses to be looted and divided, Jewish land to become communal, and a ban on Jewish usury, along with Jews to be punished by death, the establishment of laws of the Führer, the formation of an army, restrictions on journalists, and a recasting of Christianity. Apart from time and place, the Führer's list was an awful lot like the prophet's. Both men were serious about their personal views. It was their way or the highway. Mein Kampf 698 The NSGWP must not become a bailiff of public opinion, but its ruler. It must not be the masses' slave, but their master. Mohammed wasn't much of a listener either. Quran 4721 Were they to obey, showing their obedience in modest speech, after the manner of preparation for jihad had been determined for them, it would have been better. If the definition of propaganda is artful deceit, Hitler and Mohammed were grand masters. Mein Kampf 701 On behalf of our view of life, I will strike the weapon of reply from the enemy's hand personally. And how might the Fuhrer accomplish this? Mein Kampf 702 Skillful propaganda The best proof of this was furnished by the success of the propaganda introduced by me against the peace treaty of Versailles. I had before me a surging crowd filled with most sacred indignation and utter wrath. A great lie had been torn out of the brains and hearts of a multitude, and in its stead truth had been implanted. In this meeting I became familiar with the pathos and gestures which mesmerize a thousand people's demands. Islam and Nazism share an unhealthy trait, the willingness to link sacred to wrath and neither can be trusted, as they are willing to abrogate treaties which they don't like. Quran 9, verse 3, And a declaration from Allah and His Messenger to all mankind. Allah is free from all treaty obligations with non-Muslims, and so is His Messenger. Confirming the role of seductive verbal expression in achieving victory, the Fuhrer shared, Mein Kampf 704, The emphasis was put on the spoken word, because only it is in a position to bring about great changes for general psychological reasons. Enormous world revolutionary events have not been brought about by the written word, but by the spoken word. 704. The agitatory activity of speech is bound to have mass influence. Hitler went on to say that spoken words were like pictures, because they communicate more vividly and faster than text. His mentor never allowed his words to be written or read either, only spoken. And that's because... Bukhari, Allah's Apostle said some eloquent speech is as effective as magic. Also in Bukhari... The prophet said, I have been given the keys of eloquent speech and given victory with terror, so the treasures of the earth were given to me. Expounding upon the merits of Muhammad's situational scriptures, the Fuhrer said, Mein Kampf 706, The great speaker senses the words that he needs to use in order to impassion his audience. If he errs, he has the opportunity for correction. He can read his listeners' expressions to see if they understand, and he can repeat his message until he has convinced them of the correctness of what he has said. This reminds me of the eighth surah, in which Muhammad changed his presentation of the power of Islamic terror on the fly. When his militants appeared displeased with Allah's proclamation, Muhammad corrected the error and lessened the odds. Ishak Abdullah told me that when this verse came down, it was a shock to the Muslims who took it hard. They were afraid, as the odds were too great. So Allah relieved them and canceled the verse with another. Now has Allah relieved you, and he knows that there is a weakness among you. So if there are one hundred, rather than the original twenty, they shall vanquish two hundred. The sixty-sixth verse corrected the sixty-fifth. Instant abrogation. Just add grumbling. 
Der Prophet also explained why an oral recital had to be as repetitive as the Quran, a word which means to recite. Mein Kampf 706 The great speaker will repeat his message so often with so many examples, he will overcome objections and refute them before they are even raised. While the Meccan surahs were fixated on pain and punishment, with the vast majority of the 1,000 repetitions occurring therein, the Medina themes were no less repetitive. They bellowed, submit, obey, perform, pay, and fight. Hitler and Mohammed learned that their demonic message was most effective when it was revealed in the darkness of night. Mein Kampf 710 I was astonished by how much better my message was received at night. It is a mysterious magic that allows the encroachment upon a man's free will. In the evening they succumb more easily to the dominating force of a stronger will. The domineering apostolic nature weakens their resistance. Islam's apostle must have used the same psychologist to weaken men's resistance. Quran 73 verse 1 Keep watch all the night except a little, reciting the Quran as it ought to be recited, in slow, measured, rhythmic tones. We will soon entrust you with our weighty word. Surely the night is the most devout way, when the soul is most receptive, and the words are the most telling. The most telling line, Magic allows an encroachment upon man's free will, exposes the dark spirit's agenda. This is why Islam and Nazism are fatalistic, and why they are devoted to submission and to obedience. If deceit encroaches upon a man's free will, we lose our ability to choose Yahweh, and to accept His gift of eternal life. When we lose our free will, we lose the ability to love and to know God. When we lose the ability to choose, we die. It isn't a coincidence that history's least free polygious communities have succumbed to doctrines of submission. Death and destruction was not only predictable, it was a predetermined consequence. Hitler, like his mentor Mohammed, despised scribes. Mein Kampf 712 The average sparrow brain of a scribbler produces intellectual babble. Mohammed dispensed with the verbal assault. He simply killed them. Mein Kampf 715 The meeting is necessary if only because new adherents of the new movement feel lonely and are easily seized with the fear of being alone. Brought together, they sense a greater community. They are carried away by the powerful effect of the suggestive intoxication and enthusiasm of the others. The crowd confirms the correctness of the new doctrine in his mind and removes his doubt. Then he succumbs to the magic, seductive influence of the meeting. Mein Kampf 717 God be praised and thanked that unspolt people avoid bourgeois mass meetings as the devil avoids holy water. Togetherness can be seductive as it is coercive. It is the essence of mob mentality. An evil person with a bad idea can be parlayed into an eruption of uncontrollable rage. Ishak, our strong warriors, obey his orders to the letter. By us, Allah's religion is undeniably strong. You would think when our horses gallop with bits in their mouth that the sounds of demons are among them. The day we trod down the unbelievers, there was no deviation or turning from the apostles' order. During the battle, the people heard our exhortations to fight and the smashing of skulls by swords that sent heads flying. We severed necks with a warrior's blow. We have often left the slain cut to pieces and a widow crying, alas, over her mutilated husband. The study of Islam, like Nazism, is an expose on gang mentality. Uncorrupted by Islam, or left free to choose, few, if any, Arabs would have been capable of perpetrating such horrific deeds. Yet, as part of Muhammad's gang of ghouls, they fed off each other's rage. Terror and piracy became good because everyone they knew was a terrorizing pirate. This is why Christianity is personal, not collective. 
The Greek word ecclesia that we errantly translate church really means a calling out. Then, sounding like Mohammed in Mecca, the Fuhrer preached these words in Munich. Mein Kampf 715 The man who is the first representative of a new doctrine is exposed to serious oppression and urgently needs the strengthening that lies in the conviction of being a fighter in an embracing body. Muhammad found soulmates in Medina. Ishak, you came to us discredited when your message was rejected, and we believe you. You were forsaken and deserted, and we assisted you. You were a fugitive, and we took you in, sheltering you. You were poor and in need, and we comforted you. Mein Kampf 720 It was important to introduce blind discipline into our meetings and to safeguard the authority of the leader. The brutal recklessness of our guards were able to thwart the enemy's hecklers. Speaking as if he were Mohammed, Hitler said, Mein Kampf 726 Anyone who provoked us was thrown out ruthlessly. We would not tolerate any provocation. Then on page 728 before they could finish a sentence, they would find themselves thrown outside the hall. It was no different in Mohammed's day. Ishak, hypocrites used to assemble in the mosque and listen to the stories of the Muslims and laugh and scoff at their religion. So Mohammed ordered that they should be ejected. They were thrown out with great violence. Abu went to Amr, took his foot and dragged him out of the mosque. Another Muslim slapped a man's face while dragging him forcefully, knocking him down. One was pulled violently by his hair. Don't come near the Apostle's mosque again, for you are unclean. Both the Fuhrer and the Prophet had security detachments. Hitler called his first storm troops. Mein Kampf, 729. I had a protective detachment as a supervision service. They were all young party comrades who were instructed and trained to the effect that terror can be broken only by terror. By fighting for our idea, they protected me with their last drop of blood. They were saturated with the doctrine. We found that the best weapon of defense was the attack. We became known not as a debating club, but as a fighting community. My boys shined when I made it clear to them the necessity of their mission, assuring them again and again that all the wisdom of the world will remain futile if force does not enter its service, defending and protecting it. The goddess of peace can only march side by side with the god of war. Muhammad's thugs were less articulate, but they were no less loyal. Ishak we helped Allah's apostle, angry on his account, with a thousand warriors. We carried his flag on the end of our lances. We were his helpers, protecting his banner in deadly combat. We dyed it with blood, for that was its color. We were the prophet's right arm in Islam. We were his bodyguards before other troops served him. We helped him against his opponents. Allah richly rewarded that fine prophet Muhammad. Like the good Muslims who left their homes to fight a jihad for Mohammed, Hitler had helpers too, Mein Kampf 730. And how these boys stood up, like a swarm of hornets they stormed upon the mockers at our meeting, incurring wounds and making sacrifices, so that they made a path for the holy mission of our movement. Mein Kampf 747. The boys of the storm troop performed their duty. They attacked like wolves. Our opponents learned a lesson they will never forget. This is reminiscent of the Eighth Surah, which says, Inflict upon them such a defeat as will be a lesson for others, that they may be warned. And the Hadith, which substituted one pest for another. Ishak, the Muslims stole our goods and divided them. Their spears pierced us not once, but twice. Their squadrons came at us like a swarm of locusts. Were it not for the religion of Muhammad's people, their cavalry would have never attacked us. Hitler dedicates a number of pages to his personal involvement in choosing the Nazi colors, black and red, symbolizing deceit and blood, and his swastika. The Fuhrer's fixation with his flag 
was no different than the prophet's fixation on his war banners, which he told us were white, black, and red. Mein Kampf 7:33. They became a symbol for the fight of the future. It had the effect of a flaming torch. Just as Muhammad usurped the concept of war banners from his pagan ancestor Kuse, Hitler recycled an old tradition. Mein Kampf 7:36. The swastika had been used as a symbol of the Germanic religion by folkish groups in primitive cults. Even in the details, they were indistinguishable. This next passage encapsulates Muhammad's reason for founding Islam. Mein Kampf 752. Destiny chooses the man, and destiny gives him the final victory. Dissatisfied with the religious life of his people, he longs for a renovation. Based upon his inspiration, he is called upon to present a solution for this religious distress, appearing like a prophet of a new doctrine. And as a fighter against the existing ones, there is no more effective means to rule people than to claim that you are called to be God's prophet, and then to mix your poison with the passion of a pugilist. Ishak, get out of his way, you infidel unbelievers! Every good thing goes with his apostle. O、oh、Lord, I believe in his word. I know all his truth in accepting it. We will fight you about its interpretations, as we have fought you about its revelation, with strokes that will remove heads from shoulders and make enemies of friends. This Hitlerism could be Quranic. Mein Kampf 752. The strongest man is chosen for the fulfillment of the great mission. One man is the one who is exclusively called upon. They have the purest faith in their own mission. They consider themselves obliged to go their own way without considering others. Nature herself, in her inexorable logic, makes the decision by prompting fights and by leading the movement to the goal that has been chosen by the shortest and surest way. Quran 59 verse 6. Allah gives His messenger lordship and power over whomever He wills. Quran 49 verse 7. And know that among you is Allah's messenger. Were He to follow your wishes, you would fall into misfortune. By promising Valhalla, a seductive pagan and hedonistic paradise, to those who sacrifice their lives for the cause, the second tyrant mirrored the first. Mein Kampf. 768. It is certain that each hero who comes forward voluntarily and dies the sacred death of martyrdom climbs the steps to Valhalla. This is no different than Quran 474. Let those who fight in the cause of Allah sell the life of this world for the hereafter. To him who fights in the cause of Allah, whether he is slain or gets victory, soon we shall give him a great reward. Speaking of the Germans who rejected him, Hitler's never-ending argument replicates Mohammed's. Mein Kampf 768. They are scum, rabble, deserters, and pimps who shunned the light. Hyenas, freeloaders, thieves, and duty shirkers, traitors, and an undisciplined gang of looters. Criminals and evil rabble, but alas, even Hitler had to outmaneuver and threaten the peaceful hypocrites. Mein Kampf 756. Some people merely pretend that they are fighting for the same goal, but they do not honestly place themselves into the ranks of our movement. Quran 8 verse 5. Your Lord ordered you out of your homes to fight for the true cause, even though some Muslims disliked it and were averse to fighting. They argued with you concerning this matter, even after it was made clear to them. It was as if they were being driven to their death. Der Führer was as humble as der Prophet. Mein Kampf 763. One must never forget that everything that is actually great in this world has not been fought for and won by coalitions, but always by the success of one individual victor. The religious state will never be created by compromise, but only by the steel-hard willpower of one soul movement, which has struggled its way against all others. Quran 48 verse 1: 
Verily, we have granted you, Muhammad, a splendid victory. Verse 8. We have truly sent you, Muhammad, as a witness and as a warner, in order that you men may believe in Allah and his messenger, and that you may assist him and honor him, and celebrate his praise morning and evening. Islam and Nazism seduced a sufficient number of men to become popular enough to build a coercive military force. Both usurped pagan traditions to condition adherents and then established absolute authority over them. Mein Kampf 765 If popularity and force unite, then authority can be established more solidly upon tradition. When popularity, force, and tradition combined, authority becomes unshakable. This is Islam in a nutshell. Writing words that would come to haunt the world, 15, and then again 77 years after they were scribed by Hitler's hand, we discover. Mein Kampf, 787. Terror which is derived from a religion can never be broken by a formal state power. It will only succumb to a new view of life that proceeds with equal boldness and determination. The state may, for centuries, apply the strongest means of power against a terror by which it is threatened, but in the end it will be powerless and will succumb. Hitler and Mohammed were unaware of a power stronger than hate, and of a tool more effective than terror. That force is love, and its implement is truth, and that is how we must fight terror which is derived from a religion. We must love the victims of Islam enough to free them from deceit. By emancipating mankind from Mohammed's legacy, we free ourselves from its scourge. But Hitler was right in a way. Nations like America are unable to break the back of religious terror. We are unwilling to confront a religion. But by not understanding the source of the terrorist rage, we eliminate them far more slowly than the religion manufactures new ones. And even if we were to shed our ignorance, conventional defensive and offensive military tactics are counterproductive. Offensively, massive armaments and air superiority only prevail against conventional forces. Terrorists scatter, lying in wait to strike another day. And defensively, the freedoms we usurp from our citizens under the guise of homeland security only serve to create the totalitarian climate in which religious terrorists thrive. While there is good news, I'm afraid it may be too late. To combat religious terror, we don't have to become like them, as Hitler attests. All we have to do is come to understand the deceit that drives men to such madness. Collectively, if we were to see Mohammed and his terrorist dogma Islam, as we now see Hitler and Nazism, we would win the war on terror by freeing Muslims from Islam. Light extinguishes darkness, and courageous, sacrificial love overwhelms fear, hate, and terror. While Hitler's argument was wrong, it remains seductive. A time will come, according to Bible prophets, in which America and Europe will tire of their government's inability to thwart the continued onslaught of Islamic terror. They will be tempted, as were 1930s Germans, to employ the services of a similarly-minded tyrant to protect them. Like Hitler, this man will rise to prominence by promising peace. But once empowered, he'll unleash hell's fury, literally. The religious tech he'll deploy will be as demonic as Nazism and Islam. Mein Kampf 981 To end this eternal shame, people will prefer to accept the terror of the movement rather than bear an endless terror any longer. Hitler went on to use two of Allah's favorite words, Mein Kampf, 798. What we need is not one hundred daring plotters, but many hundreds of thousands of fanatical fighters for our view of life. Mein Kampf, 801. Give the German nation six million bodies, faultlessly trained, all of them glowing with passion for the highest spirit of attack, and we will have an army. Quran 47, verse 4. 
Therefore, when you clash with the unbelieving infidels in battle, strike them and overpower them. At length, when you have thoroughly subdued them, make them prisoners in bondage until the war lays down its burdens. Thus are you commanded. He lets you fight in order to test you, but those who are slain in Allah's cause will never have their deeds go to waste. Quran 47, verse 31, We shall try you until we know those among you who are the fighters, and we shall try your reported metal. Quran 47, 33, Believers, obey Allah and obey the Messenger. Those who disbelieve and hinder men from the cause of Allah, or jihad, He will not pardon. Do not falter, become faint-hearted, or weak-kneed, crying for peace. You have the upper hand. Muhammad's contemporaries saw him as a lying thief and a murdering bandit. We know this because their criticisms are chronicled in the Quran. Hitler was not immune. His contemporaries said, Mein Kampf 807, Lovingly they showered upon us the pet names, murderers, bandits, robbers, and criminals. But the SA, Stormtroop, maintained perfect order, daring to smash the skulls of those who resisted. The translators of Mein Kampf provided the grim details. During the formation period of Nazism, 1923 to 1931, quote, The Hitlerites killed 323 Marxists and seriously wounded 750. Other Nazi rivals lost 48 men. The perpetrators of Mein Kampf suffered 86 dead and 25 wounded. End quote. But as with the initial Islamic terrorist raids perpetrated by Muhammad, one murder quickly led to another. Death becomes an avalanche. Scores of rotting corpses became hundreds, then thousands, then millions. Returning to one of Der Prophet's favorite themes, Der Fuhrer protests Mein Kampf, 827. Systematically, Jewish parasites ravish our innocent young blonde girls, thus destroy the Aryan race. Yet both Christian denominations disregard the degradation and annihilation of the noble and unique race God gave the earth. It is not important whether Protestants vanquish Catholics or Catholics vanquish Protestants, but whether Aryans survive. Any who reject this work thereby declares war on the Lord's creation and upon His divine will. Ishak, some Muslims remained friends with the Jews, so Allah sent down a Quran forbidding them to take the Jews as friends. From their mouths hatred has already shown itself, and what they conceal is worse. Quran 2.59 We sent a plague upon the Jews from heaven for their evil doing. Quran 5, verse 82, You will find the Jews and disbelievers the most vehement in hatred for the Muslims. Mein Kampf, 845. Nazism must claim the right to force its principles on the whole and educate everyone about its ideas and thoughts without regard to previous boundaries. This is an order to impose Islam on the whole world and then to indoctrinate the victims. Bukhari, Allah's apostle said, I have been ordered to fight the people till they say, None has the right to be worshipped but Allah. Speaking immodestly of how he created his religiotech, Hitler shares some extremely relevant insights. Mein Kampf 848 Great theorists are only in the rarest cases great organizers. The greatness of the program maker lies in the recognition and in the establishment of abstractly correct rules, while the organizer has to be a psychologist. He has to take man as he is, and thus must know him. He must not over-evaluate him. He must try to account for his weaknesses and his bestial nature, so that the program becomes a strong, constant force, suitable for carrying an idea and paving its way to success. Hitler's words bind him to Mohammed and separate both men from Moses and the Messiah. Islam and Nazism see man as lowly and replaceable. They appeal to man's weaknesses, his bestial nature. They seduce men into becoming a militant force for the benefit of the program maker. 
Hitler was even suggesting that Islam was made dim-witted and bestial on purpose. It was as dumb and visceral as the men it was perpetrated upon. The reason the word religion can't be found in the Old Covenant and is only used negatively in the New Covenant is that Judeo-Christianity is not a religion. It's not a movement, a cause, a mission, or a program. It's a relationship that focuses on the spirit and not on the flesh. Mein Kampf 848 Rarely is a great theorist a great leader. More usually, he is an agitator who shows the ability of imparting an idea to the masses as a psychologist and a demagogue. For to lead means to be able to move the masses. While I wouldn't go so far as to say that Muhammad was a great theorist, leader, or psychologist, he was certainly an agitator and a demagogue. And two out of five was sufficient to move the masses. Hitler glorified himself using similar terms to those used by the Islamic apologists to elevate Mohammed's status. Mein Kampf 849 The combination of the theorist, or prophet, organizer, or politician, and leader, or general, in one person is the rarest thing to be found on this globe. The combination makes the great man. By calling his message propaganda, Hitler was being more honest with his audience than was Mohammed. Both knew they were lying. One had the courtesy to tell us so. Mein Kampf 851 The first task of propaganda, read Quran recitals, is the winning of the people for the future organization, read Islam. The first task of the organization, read Islam, is the winning of the people for the continuation of propaganda. The second task of propaganda, read the Quran, is the destruction of existing doctrines, read Judeo-Christianity. The second task of the organization must be the fight for power, read Muslim militancy, so that it will achieve the final success of the doctrine, read World Religious Conquest, Total Submission. Tabari, the messenger sent Khalid with an army of 400 and ordered him to invite people to Islam before he fought them. If they were to respond and submit, he was to teach them the Book of Allah, the Sunnah of his Prophet, and the requirements of Islam. If they should decline, he was to fight them. Ishak, the Apostle used to say, their religion will never march with ours. Mein Kampf 851 the most striking success of the revolution of a view of life will always be won whenever the new view of life is taught to all people and, if necessary, is forced upon them. Neville Chamberlain gave this man the high ground of Czechoslovakia, thinking that it would satiate his cravings. That proved to be as fatal as George Bush's roadmap to peace, in which he proposed to give the high ground of Israel to the Muslims. One doctrine has, and the other doctrine will, force its view of life on everyone within its reach. Tabari, give the people the good news of paradise and the way to attain it. Warn them of the hell fire and the way to earn it. Teach them the rites of the Hajj. He orders you to offer prayer at the appropriate times and with the proper bowing and humility. He orders you to give one-fifth of Allah's booty and pay the zakat tax. It is enjoined on the faithful from their land and property. Quran 8, verse 39. Fight them until the only religion is Islam. When will we learn to read the words on the page? When will we come to understand that tolerating evil leads to disaster? Islam and Nazism are intolerant, dictatorial fighting machines. Mein Kampf, 852. The highest task of the organization is to see to it that no kind of internal disagreements among the members of the movement weaken the work of the movement. The spirit of determined aggression must not die out. It must be constantly renewed and fortified. It must never lose its fighting force and must propagate the idea with determination and with attack. The more radical and inciting my propaganda was, the more it frightened off the weaklings, read hypocrites, and prevented them from pushing into the nucleus of our organization. Hitler would have loved this poem. Ishak 
Muhammad is the man, an apostle of my Lord who errs not. Any who would rival him must fail. Evil was the state of our enemy, so they lost the day. We came upon them like lions from the thickets. The armies of Allah came openly, flying at them in rage, so they could not get away. We destroyed them and forced them to surrender. In the former days there were no battles like this. Their blood flowed freely. We slew them and left them in the dust. Those who escaped were choked with terror. A multitude of them were slain. This is Allah's war, in which those who do not accept Islam will have no chance. Mein Kampf, 856. Folkish religious visionaries procure leadership for themselves, and they collapse the plots that swirl around them. I was unanimously given the entire leadership of the movement. New articles were accepted, which entrusted me with full responsibility, and this proved its value in the most blissful manner. Mein Kampf, 858. All collaborators were made subordinate to me. Muslim, we used to take oaths to the Messenger of Allah that we would listen to and obey his orders. He would tell us to say in the oath, As far as it lies in my power... Quran 48.10 Verily those who swear allegiance to you, Muhammad, indeed swear their allegiance to Allah. Nazism was as peaceful as Islam. Mein Kampf 891 To forge the sword is the task of leadership. The mission is to seek comrades in arms. 892 The correct road is to strengthen our power by winning new soil and new territory. Mein Kampf 950. We Nazis say, the right to soil and territory is a duty for a great nation which must extend its boundaries. The clues in Mein Kampf that the Nazis were intent on world conquest were no less vague than those found in the Quran. Mein Kampf 953. The German needs only to be given land by the sword. Bukhari. Expel disbelievers from the Arabian Peninsula. Quran 2, 191. Slay them wherever you find and catch them, and drive them out from where they have turned you out, for persecution and oppression are worse than slaughter. Quran 33, 25. Allah drove the disbelievers back and helped the believers in battle. He terrorized the people of the book, so that you killed some and made some captives. He made you inherit their lands, their homes, and their wealth. He gave you a country you had not traversed before. Neville Chamberlain wasn't the only fool. Stalin also signed a peace treaty with Hitler years after Mein Kampf was written. And yet in Mein Kampf, page 959, we read, the conclusion of a treaty with Russia embodies the declaration of the next war. The Fuhrer, like the Prophet, enjoyed projecting his faults on his foes. We must never forget that the rulers of present-day Russia are common blood-stained criminals, the scum of humanity. They butchered and rooted out millions of leading intellectuals with savagery. They have imposed the most frightful regime of tyranny of all time. The Marxists and their Jewish comrades combine bestial horror and an inconceivable gift for lying. They intend to impose bloody oppression upon the whole world. One does not conclude a treaty with someone whose sole interest is destruction. The only difference between Hitler and Mohammed in the application of this stratagem was, Hitler was right. The Fuhrer went on to share, the struggle of the Jewish Marxist conquest of the world requires a clear attitude towards Soviet Russia. You cannot drive out the devil with Beelzebub, which is another name for Satan. This is similar to Satan's impersonating Gabriel while speaking for Allah and then condemning Satan. Mein Kampf 920 Peace treaties, whose demands are a scourge to a people, frequently beat the first drum roll of a coming rebellion. The boundless extortion and shameful abasement are the means of whipping up national passions to the boiling point. The propagandist utilization of these sadistic atrocities can remove indifference and raise indignation to the most blazing anger. 
Every point should be burned into the brain and into the heart of men until sixty million share the same hate, causing a sea of flames out of whose glow a steely will arises and the cry, We want more arms! Yes, a peace treaty can do all of that. It becomes the greatest propaganda weapon for re-arousing the dormant spirits of a cause. Mein Kampf 920 We must reimplant in the people the spirit of proud self-respect, manly defiance, and wrathful hate. The first Muslims didn't take kindly to peace treaties either. Tabari and Ishak the companions of the Prophet had set out not doubting that they would conquer because of a vision Muhammad had seen. Therefore, when they saw the negotiations for peace, the retreat, and the obligations the messenger agreed to, the Muslims felt so grieved about it that they were close to despair. Some were depressed to the point of death. So, in Quran 9, verse 3, an announcement from Allah and His Messenger to the people assembled on the day of the great pilgrimage that Allah and His Messenger dissolve treaty obligations with the pagans. And then, Quran 9, verse 5, Fight and kill the disbelievers wherever you find them. Take them captive, torture them, lie in wait and ambush them using every stratagem of war telling us how Nazi and Islamic tyrannies would use Land for Peace roadmaps to propagate their fury and lead the world to war, the Fuhrer explained. Everything, beginning with the child's primer, down to the last newspaper, every theater and every picture, every billboard and every wall, must be placed at the service of this single great mission, until the prayer of fear of our patriots cry, Lord, to deliver us, the burning plea must come, even from the smallest child. Almighty God, bless our arms. Lord, bless our battle. The Muslims also had such a prayer. Bukhari, the prophet offered the prayer of fear when it was still dark, and said, Allahu Akbar. Kabar is destroyed, for whenever we approach a hostile nation to fight, then evil will be in the morning for those who have been warned. The inhabitants came out running. The prophet had their men killed, their children and women taken as captives. Bukhari When Allah's apostle fought or raided people, we raised our voices, saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, none has the right to be worshipped but Allah and they went off to wage holy war. Mein Kampf, 932. May reason, capital R, the signifying deity, be our leader. The sacred duty to act gives us determination, and our highest protector, capital P, thus deity, remains our faith. Mein Kampf, 925. We may suffer many bitter blows, but this isn't the grounds for abandoning reason, capital R, with squabbling, instead of standing up with a concentrated force against our enemy. Quran 8, verse 60, And make ready against the infidels all of the power you can, including steeds of war. The noble Quran says these are tanks, planes, missiles, and artillery. To threaten the enemies of Allah and your enemy. And whatever you spend in Allah's cause shall be repaid unto you. Quran 61, verse 14. O Muslims, be helpers of Allah. We gave power to those who believed against their enemies, and they became the ones that prevailed. Ishak, a sharp sword in the hand of a brave man kills his adversary. Muhammad called his dark spirit a protector too, even when his armed force was preparing to swoop down, terrorize, and plunder innocents. Ishak, when the apostle looked down, he said, O Allah, Lord of the heavens, and what they overshadow, and Lord of the devils, and what into error they throw, the Lord of the winds, and what they winnow, we ask thee for the booty of this town and its people. We take refuge in thee from its evil and the evil of its people. Forward in the name of Allah. He used to say this of every town he raided. Mein Kampf ends as it begins. 
by praising martyrs and by wrapping overtly religious themes around their death. Mein Kampf, 993 At the end of this volume, I want to bring before the eyes of our adherents and of the crusaders for our doctrine, those eighteen heroes to whom I dedicated the first volume of my work, as those heroes consciously sacrificed themselves for all of us. They must always recall the fulfillment of a duty, a duty which they fulfilled with the best faith despite the consequences. I want to reckon men who by words, thoughts, and deeds dedicated their lives to the awakening of our nation. I quote from Eckert's poem, Father in heaven, resolve to the death, bow we before thee. Does any other people follow thine artful command more loyally than do we Germans? Then, Eternal One, send us the victory. Mighty with fate, thou smilest with joy at our holy crusade. I could give you any of a thousand Koran and Hadith quotes to match this, but instead I'd like you to contemplate the overwhelming similarity of the message, the motivation, and the means Hitler and Mohammed used to attack mankind. Then consider the consequence of ignoring or even tolerating Hitler's holy crusade during the fifteen years between the time he wrote it and the time he enacted it. If we behave similarly today, now that Mohammed's mantra has been revealed, a billion people will remain enslaved by Islam, and within a quarter century, a quarter of the earth's people will die because of it.